Okay. Well, I think perhaps if we start now tentatively, there are a few people still coming in, um, but the uh, the numbers are starting to steady off now. So I think perhaps perhaps people's sound have come on and perhaps perhaps they've been able to get into the webinar. In which case, it is lovely to see you all. Welcome very much. This uh, this fine evening here, we're expecting a bit of rain, hopefully. I hope it's all very nice where you are. We are here with Toby James, who has written the report that we would like to talk about today, which is about democracy under strain, particularly democratic backsliding and strengthening. Um, so let's start by, uh, by, well, I should probably start by introducing myself. So my name is Jessica Metheringham, your chair for this evening. This report comes um, from the Powering Up Project, which is partly Unlock Democracy, the other parts from Compass. It's entirely funded by the Joseph Rowntree Reform Trust. And Toby will take us through uh, the bones of this report for about 15 minutes or so. Then we will dive straight into some questions. So perhaps I should say, or perhaps we should just hand over to Toby. So Toby, it's over to you. Tell us about Powering Up. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jess. And thank you, uh, for, I should also say, uh, for um, kind of funding this report. Now, the first test of this, of this evening is to see whether I can successfully share the screen. So let's see um, if that's working OK. Jess, can you give me a, a thumbs up or, or, or a wave just so that I know that everyone's looking at that? Yeah, that's good. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So I think this report comes at a particularly important time. Uh, the world is kind of facing kind of many global challenges, um, climate change being one. Uh, we're going to see how that pans out into the future. Um, AI is something I'm trying to swat up on at the moment, and we're going to see how that pans out into the future. But actually, democracy is also very much amongst these global challenges uh, that, we're, that we're facing. Uh, now, there's a large widespread consensus that actually we're now seeing a period of global democratic backsliding. The quality of democracy around the world is thought to be regressing. And according to the varieties of democracy project um, who, who evaluate the quality of, of um, democracy around the world, the world is back to 1986 levels of democracy. And actually now we've also, according to them, reached a tipping point where there are actually uh, more dictatorships in the world than there are democracies. And this speaks to all of the challenges that we're, that, that we're, that we're facing at the moment. Obviously, events in Russia and, and Ukraine sort of in many ways epitomize um, the front line of this battle between democracies uh, and dictatorships. And just the the figure here kind of, kind of illustrates this in red countries that are, that are kind of categorized as being autocratic in blue here the countries that are uh, thought to be democratic um, but just to give you a bit of a sense of the tipping point in this story um, this is the quality of democracy since going back to you know over the period of the last 200 years I and mean, obviously it's been a story so far of progress but if you look at the point the kind of critical point here uh, actually around 2012, democracy is thought to have been going backwards. And this is a really, really important part of the story of, of where we are right now. And there's global international efforts to try to, to redress this. The uh, United States launched something called uh, the, uh, the Summit for Democracy uh, a couple of years ago and asked countries to make specific commitments to how they were going to improve uh, democracy. Uh, the UK initially made some commitments there, um, but uh, were tended to be looking at how the UK could promote democracy overseas. So the question then is, well, what can, uh, what is the quality of democracy actually in the backyard of some of the elite, some of the countries that are trying to be uh, beacons for democracy around the world? And what is the quality of democracy that we're seeing here in the UK as well? And so what I'm going to do in the report, uh, in this presentation, is, is to, uh, just to sketch out, as Jess said, some of the bare bones of, of the findings here uh, and lead that through to 
um, a sort of discussion about um, what next, what needs to be done in order to address this. And, um, you know, obviously, hopefully the report's out today, so uh, I'm sure uh, many people might not have a chance to read it in, in, in full yet. Um, but I would like to see this very much as a discussion about you know, what we can and what we should, should do. Something that's first is very important is what do we actually mean by democracy? Um, because this is really quite critical. We've seen that we've heard the word democracy thrown around quite a lot in recent in recent years, particularly around Brexit and uh, claims that you know, taking take take back control. So, what do we mean when we're thinking about democracy? And I think it's worth pointing out that there's actually several different layers uh, to democracy, seven several different concepts that are that are available there. And I think what I want to kind of encourage people to use is, is kind of a belt and belt belt and braces approach where we think about a, a multi-dimensional kind of view of democracy uh, and a view of democracy that is, is in some ways different to how we originally saw democracy as it was established uh, in the UK many, many uh, kind of centuries um, ago. So democracy is a number of things. Firstly, it's about elections. Elections are important. So sometimes we think about electoral democracy is you know, whether we have elections that are fair and free and allow us to hold uh, our, our government to account. Sometimes we also think about the liberal dimension to democracy, and this is really thinking about whether political power is decentralized down to the local level, and whether we've got some kind of constraints on whoever is in power in number 10, whichever political party, whichever political affiliation, uh, count the people hold them to account for the, for the, for the mistakes, uh, for the errors, but also reward them for the, for the decisions they make. Democracy should be participatory. Democracy are at, at their best where we don't just have elections, but actually we had widespread participation in elections, because if we don't have that, then decisions will find themselves being made by a kind of narrow or small, smaller part of the electorate. And that undermines some of those important principles of equality. It's also really important that democracy involves good quality deliberation. It's not just that we aggregate and count up all the votes at election day. We actually discuss the key political issues of the, of the day. We have good quality deliberation. We, if we use evidence. Uh, we don't use hate speech or try to intimidate uh, our, our opponents. Uh, democracy is about having those difficult conversations and progressing through them. And then lastly, it's also important to think about the resources that people have to actually participate in democracy. Um, having uh, economic educational resources that are really, really important for us to be able to participate. But it is also the case that you know, democratic culture can be really important too. If we find ourselves in, democrat in a culture in which people systematically dis discriminated against, that also inhibits um, democracy, both inside those key uh, institutions of, of office, but also in uh, at home in elections as well. So I think I want to push for thinking democracy much more you know, in, the, in, the broader, in the broader sense. And what we're going to do now is, is, is take through some of the key developments that we've seen uh, in the UK since 2019. Um, I'm not going to highlight everything in this presentation. I'll try and keep it bare bones. Um, as Jess suggests, um, but more is in the report. And there may obviously be some things which the report does not cover, but the key thing here is what are these key developments? What's happened since 2019, particularly since um, that, that general election um, took, took place? So looking, first of all, at, at elections, um, some, of the, some of the headlines here will be familiar. We know that we've gone, had some of the major changes really in electoral law. One of the most significant pieces of, of electoral law uh, for, for many years that in the Elections Act 2022. A headline that people will notice, uh, some people have noticed so far at the English local elections, but which everybody will notice at the forthcoming general election unless things change, is that we now need to provide photographic uh, identification in order to be able to exercise uh, our democratic right to vote. Um, and I've argued elsewhere, you can have voter ID at elections and that can work well, but not when you have a full, you're acquiring identification that 
many people don't have. And I think according to most estimates, 4 million people uh, don't um, have the required form of identification according to the government and, and, and research. And at the, at the local elections, 4% um, of people uh, were not able to, or did not vote in those elections according to the Electoral Commission because of uh, the voter identification requirements. This, so these are really, really important things. Um, Electoral Commission independence is one other area that's been flagged here. The Committee on, on Public Standards has also pointed to perhaps maybe one of the most significant threats to democracies around the world is actually kind of foreign interference in our elections. Uh, countries took many, many years to actually put in place for electoral finance regulations, but most of those electoral finance regulations were designed in a pre-social media e era. And so one of the key challenges that countries, not just the UK are facing, is how do we regulate their influence uh, of foreign countries in our, in our elections uh, as well. But some of these things aren't just because the government's passed uh, an electoral law. Some of these things are also developments that are owned, that taking place within society. It's transformations that take place uh, without the government necessarily getting involved. So things like media ownership and media concentration can be particularly important. Um, media concentration within the ownership of national newspapers has increased. So this means that potentially fewer people have a much greater influence in terms of setting the political agenda going forward. And something that's also particularly important in terms of media is also uh, the pressures that local journalists are put under, or at least the perhaps the companies that um, employ local journalists, uh, there are cost pressures there. And it's meant that the quality and, and the amount of local journalism that we're seeing uh, across the UK uh, is potentially being reduced. I mean, I should say, each of these points on the slides we can, might be points for questions or points for, dis, for points for discussion. So we can go, and I'm going to skip through, uh, skip through some of these. But you can also see other pieces of legislation here as well in terms of the online safety bill, how this potentially allows um, the control over key issues such as free speech on, on these platforms to be put outside of the boundaries of the UK. And that is a really kind of quite important point for thinking about the quality um, of UK uh, democracy. So secondly then, in the second dimension, thinking about um, rights, standards, uh, the balance of powers, you know, there's lots under this kind of category. And obviously one of the key transformations that we've seen, um, or the key headline, uh, headline grabbing events over the past few years has, has been developments related to party gate. And I think as the Guardian kind of put it um, in its headline or editorial about a year ago, in some ways, this was a bit, a bit of a test for democracy. If you have people in government right at the top who are responsible for making laws, but also breaking those laws, is there going to be political accountability? Is UK democracy going to respond to this and effectively um, you know, um, provide accountability? In a sense, it did. Boris Johnson resigned um, as Prime Minister and subsequently resigned um, from as, a, as an MP ahead of his um, the, the verdict from a parliamentary committee. So in a sense, this is due process and not necessarily uh, what we would call democratic backsliding, but th there is a, a tension here and a real issue, which is that some of the, um, the claims about the system um, the way in which the system has been politicised, um, the disrespect for, for due process within parliamentary process, actually is a real tension, and the long-term legacy of that is something we, you know, we're going to have to monitor um, going 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 forward. There's also um, kind of political rights um, as citizens more uh, commonly kind of experience them. We've seen restrictions on the right to protest through two different pieces of legislation. Uh, so our ability to complain, to take, uh, undertake our democratic rights is, has been restricted uh, by law. It's important to add also that the law itself has been unevenly experienced uh, by, by citizens, ethnicity, gender, uh, being really important dimensions to this. This is in, obviously nothing new in the United Kingdom, 
but since 2019 we've had particular reports um, draw attention um, kind of to this. Opportunities for participation, so obviously we have had many elections um, at, at the local level since 2019, but in some ways a slightly pos positive development has been that it tends to be the case that we have more greater opportunity to be involved in election of party leaders, or at least members have the opportunity to be uh, involved in, in the election of, of party leaders. That's in many ways a, pos a positive development, an element of democratic uh, kind of strengthening that, that we have seen. Of course, you know, some of those contests, they're also selecting uh, the prime minister. Uh, and of course, that also means that a relatively small number of people are involved in those contests. But nonetheless, this is um, quite important. There's then been um, some opportunities for, for, for involvement in directly elected mayors. Um, some devolution has taken place, although there's some criticism about the extent to which that devolution has been meaningful. But maybe one real tension here is, is actually some of the allocation of money by central government to, lo to at the local level. There's been some evidence, very strong evidence, that this is involves a part pork barrelling, i.e. it's been allocated on a partisan basis. And this really therefore kind of undermines some of these, um, some of these institutions and opportunities and meaning, meaningful participation. In terms of deliberation, uh, discussion, debate, so obviously this has been a very, very particular era since 2019. Uh, we've seen the pandemic. And in many ways, this has been an era in which evidence has been uh, kind of really at the forefront of public, public policy. The use of the scientific evidence was something the government was particularly using throughout the pandemic period. Although, of course, uh, infamously did, did not use necessarily on every key or every particular issue. But then the side part to this is there's been um, evidence from the Constitution Unit that actually the deliberation within Parliament has often been cut short. Bills rushed through several pieces of legislation on the final day of, of Parliament, for example, which kind of really prevents our ability um, to, to kind of scrutinise and think about what, what's going on here. And then for citizens, um, social media has also been a site for this information. Social media has become more and more important. And as a result, um, the disinformation, and there's more about this in the report, um, becomes a particular challenge for uh, kind of society level deliberation. And then lastly, educational uh, economic resources, I think political culture is really important as part of this. And we know that uh, the UK, like many societies, has uh, kind of underlying uh, economic educational inequalities. There's nothing kind of new there. But the pandemic has really perhaps put some key pressures on this. There's thought to have widened those, uh, according to some research, and that's going to have um, long term effects um, that you know will take a while to, 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 to overcome. There's then the question about are we bringing about, you know, not just high quality education, but are we bringing the political education? I mean by that the information that citizens need to be involved in, in, in uh, politics of high quality um, going forward. And if educational resources, if economic resources, if democratic culture are really, really important, you know, we can see some of the ways in which this has been undermined uh, at various levels um, since, uh, since 2019, including legislation that uh, reduces citizens' um, kind of rights to uh, undertake or part take part in a, a, a strike. So I guess, I, I guess, you know, I think this is an important, really important moment. As I said, democracy matters. It really does matter. Um, obviously, as we go, go forward to a general election, a natural tendency might be to focus on issues such as the economy, uh, but also public services, which obviously are crucially important too. But the decisions that we make on those topics uh, the decisions that we make on the economy, the decisions that we make on public services need to be good decisions. They need to be better decisions. And better decisions are always made better in a democracy where there's accountability for poor decisions, uh, where the information is, is made available, where there's transparency, where those that make good decisions are rewarded, where those that don't uh, 
are kind of punished in terms of the in terms of the ballot box. So democracy is absolutely crucial. And all these things very much um, kind of come together. And I think heading into the electoral campaign, thinking about the next uh, general election, there are opportunities for parties um, to renew them uh, and to make commitments, particularly to renewing democracy. And this is really important. I would say all parties have this opportunity to renew, to make commitments to renewing democracy in, 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 the, in, the, in the manifestos. And I, and I guess, you know, as, as someone who's been writing about politics for a long time, um, one critical moment in terms of the evolution of UK democracy was Charter 88, uh, was the founding of, of this charter. And, you know, I often share this to, to students in lectures and point out how, you know, it was, it was very influential when it got, um, I think it was 5,000 signatures within a short period of time. And I think, what, 5,000? That's not, that's not many, that's not very many by today's standards. And they have a point insofar as it's now much easier to get a mass movement in terms of public signatures behind behind something. And I think now is the, now is the moment to kind of set a, a charter um, for democratic renewal in, in the UK. Now, what that should look like, um, you know, I'm, I'm presenting this in a way uh, as a little bit of some ideas for suggestion and um, I welcome uh, kind of comments very much on this, but also people's own thoughts about what they would like, what they think should be included in some kind of uh, future charter for, for democratic renewal, because they might be, might be some of these things that I've suggested here. There might be other things. Um, but I think that so, some of the, some coalition around these points um, will enable and could be really, really important for setting forward um, Britain as, as a leader in terms of democracy internationally, but also for its citizens uh, coming going forward. I think I might run a slightly over time, but uh, thanks, Jess, and I very much welcome kind of comments and, and things from, from the room. That's fine. Slightly over time is absolutely fine, particularly when it's uh... <laughs> flowing so well and to finish with this charter I think is a really good thing um, because I think I'd quite like to ask you a question first about that or question it's more like two questions <laughs> which is looking at those recommendations you've made which which do you think would have the most impact which do you think would be the simplest to enact so kind of, you know, which would change the most and which would be the low hanging fruit to use the, you know, the popular management phrase? Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I guess without trying to duck the question to start with, I would say they all really do come together as part of an agenda because when they addressing some issues then help to resolve um, others, for example. I mean, if you think about um, bringing about you know, a reformed House of Lords, you know, that in, that increases uh, opportunities for political accountability, democratic participation, and that also helps other things. So I think, I think they all do um, come, come together. Um, I mean, I welcome people's views on what, and I would encourage any future government to, to set out a broad agenda that covers all of this, you know, uh, that, that, that's really crucial. I mean, some of these things, yes, are very, very easy and straightforward. So, you know, number two and three, thinking about what what can you do to voter ID, it, that's really easy and straightforward. You, you basically expand the range of IDs, forms of ID that people have access to. I've argued before that you should have a, like a, a vouching system where if, if I forgot my ID on the day, and I'm with you, Jess. You can show your ID, and you can sign a document to say this is this is this is Toby James. And then, if I'm not really that person, you know, there's a paper there's a paper trail. So those are really easy, really easy fixes. Likewise, independence of the electoral commission. I mean, I do think reforming the electoral system um, will probably have for Westminster will probably have the biggest um, seismic effect in terms of actually restructuring uh, uh, politics. It is also probably by nature one of the more difficult ones i think to 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 achieve um because of you know some political concerns that might be might that might be there probably the biggest um is a fully codified constitution that would be that would be enormous uh, enormous in the sense of what a moment that would be for a country to say well these are our democratic rights and, and to write that down into a codified document that would be you know absolutely his, his historic um 
that is a challenge to get everyone to agree, of course, to to a constitution. But again, it's not it's not impossible. And I think um, that's something that you know, I think setting that aspiration is 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 is, is the first step towards doing that. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of people who have sort of said things about the mainstream media. Uh, so Rona has said, can you talk about the role that the mainstream media has? Grassroots for Europe has then said, you know, what about the mainstream media? You know, with most newspapers, you know, there are five billionaires who are in charge of this and they're also tax, um, they're tax exiles, you know. So, so how does the media feed into how we as citizens think about politics? Yeah, no, it's, it is it is really important. I think, um, you know, studies do show that over time, the more that people um, read a particular uh, newspaper, it can gradually, it's not an immediate effect, but it can gradually uh, um, shape our views. But it's the it's the agenda setting value, which is, which, which is really, really important there. Um, so I think, um, so it's a it's a really um, kind of pressing topic. I mean, I guess media. I say some of the, some of these recommendations come together. Again, this is where political literacy is absolutely kind of fundamental to this. Um, you know, look at the recommendations of the APPG. Um, you know, what the work that Shout Out UK, for example, are, are doing. I think I think it's not just part of a democracy is enabling a, a free media. Um, so there are some things you can do and should do perhaps through the regulation, but you can only probably go so, go so far as well, while also being a democracy. So I think that the educational component that is is is, is really um, important. Um, one thing that is in the control of um, the government or the state or society is state TV. So really, the BBC I think is I think is really at the at the centre. Uh, of that, um, and so I think having a having a BBC that is uh, well regulated, that is that is neutral and is shown to be neutral in terms of appointments uh, to that, um, I think are are in a kind of really in, really, really crucial. Mm. Just thinking about that, actually. Um, so there have been questions about media, but we haven't thought about social media particularly which of course is supposed to you know to cut through that and say you know we can talk to each other but it then locks us into silos and bubbles and we end up you know talking to people who feel the same way as we do and we end up you know perhaps not swapping views in the way that we should um so i'd be really interested firstly to hear about social media but secondly to hear about what you thought about how we reach people who are no longer at school, you know, so Shout Out UK has done some great things with schools, but how do we reach the rest of us, you know, who may be more reluctant to learn the older we get? Yeah, no, they, they are, they are million dollar questions. I think, you know, all societies are, are kind of really um, kind, of fight, kind, of, kind of struggling with those. Um, I mean, and I guess there are some things we can live with and some things which we we, we just need to build up our kind of uh, kind of skills there. I mean, thinking with social media, I think obviously there are, there, can, there are some things which can be done in terms of regulating kind of hate speech and making sure that um, media, social media platforms respond quickly to, you know, cases of um, trolling and uh, both, both of the public, but also parliamentarians, um, you know, clamp down there um, on, on racism. Um, but I think it's very difficult to to regulate um, social media kind of all, all together. Um, and, you know, uh, perhaps people in the room have, have, a, have a better solution than, than, I, than I do there, which is why I, I guess I didn't include it as part of any kind of future uh, kind of charter. I think probably where it's most, the real tension is where you get social media combining with elections, because it's a question of social media really matters during the election period if people are spreading um, information to promote a particular party or candidate or also to uh, kind of criticize a political party or candidate and if that's just the general public then that, then that's then that's fine but if those those posts are being boosted um, by 
uh, investment in kind of paid adverts and, and, if, and everything else, then that's giving parties undue uh, kind of influence. Um, or, sorry, it's giving parties a particular advantage. And if that's because that's they've got more resources because they've got more members, and that's fine. But actually, where is that money kind of necessarily coming from? And I don't think we've really grasped that. Uh, in, in, in the UK. So I think there's those key things which we can focus on. And I don't know how to reach that at <laughs> so school. And I welcome comments. I mean, there are some things you can do. Um, you, can, you can develop apps, for example, that basically people put in um, their preference, their, their views on the NHS, whether they want more, a bigger NHS or smaller NHS. And then you can, can those things can then uh, match you against a political party and those are really based on their manifestos and those are really really good tools um so those are things that can be done but again there's a sort of minefield there of who's producing those who's producing um those tools um so. no absolutely those often seem to be uh taken by people to be things about you know how they should vote for their area you know so yeah. people are then looking at the system we've got and they're saying you now how can we vote tactically which would lead us down the pr discussion uh do you want to address that very quickly you know what would pr do in order to to change our democracy you know presumably make it better but but in what way i suppose yeah, so I mean, just just to come off the, back, the last question, I mean, before we go to PR, I mean, one thing we can do is provide all voters with more information about elections. And so, we did this in a separate report recently, was to say what information do we provide voters, and we don't provide them a lot um, actually. Um, if you want to look at the list of candidates, then go to the local newspaper, or uh, there's a obviously there's a project that we just put together um, by by the third sector but not actually a single website where we can go, right, I live here, these are the candidates, these are the results at the last election. And I think that's absolutely really important to actually give citizens the information they need to order, decide who, who to vote for. Um, and so I think yeah, there are some things that, that can be done there. I guess moving to PR, um, I mean, what, one of the biggest problems that we have in, in the country at the moment is that we have to just have so many wasted votes insofar as if you live in a constituency which is, has a very strong majority in favor of one party or another then your vote it doesn't make a difference it doesn't it doesn't, doesn't make too much of a difference what that outcome is going to be um, and that really disincentivizes people to vote so you say sometimes people say it's irrational to vote. It, it, it almost is irrational for people to take part uh, in those elections if we don't actually um, have a system where their where their vote um, does make a difference. And then if their vote does make a difference, all of a sudden that changes parties as well. It means they have to to reach out to the people um, that are not uh, that up until now actually haven't been taking part in elections. And we know that. Is nine, up to nine million people um, either missing from the electoral register or incorrectly registered. Um, you know, there are many more people don't vote in a general election than actually vote for the winner. Um, if you actually look at the proportion of um, mm -hmm. uh, people that actually vote for the incumbent government over the past um, decade or so, it's usually about one in four people. So we shouldn't really be surprised that there's a, a government. Um, which people may not feel particularly positive about if only one in four people in the country voted for them. It's not really a particularly strong accountability link. No, absolutely. Uh, probably at this point, let me uh, bring in the fact that there are some comments being made by Marisha about how many people don't feel that the politicians speak for them, you know, because they're from different, um, they're from different ethnic groups you know so they feel that they don't understand and they don't get the you know the tolerance the sort of you know the hostility and the aggression you know that there are towards many minority groups here in the UK and so you know a lot of politicians are just not addressing that and that is seeping into our democracy and you know poisoning in it um so marisha has the second question down marisha has asked about you know 
um, why there's so little discussion of how to dial down this aggression rather than, you know, rather than the escalating which is happening at the moment. You know, so I'd like to just hear your views a little bit on that, if you can. You know, can we can we try to make our democracy better for the whole country, not just for specific, you know, majority groups? Yeah, um, yeah, I think dialing down is, is really important. I mean, there's so many things here on here. There are some things that constitutional changes can make a difference to, and I think there are some policies and some laws where we, where we can do more or do better. You know, within parties, for example, quotas for for candidates makes makes a difference, and that can actually that kind of feeds through to to to, to, to political parties of broadening the candidates, and it makes people feel more more engaged. I mean, there is also an element here that part of all this is really that it's sort of up to the gatekeepers as well. Um, it's about people, it's about leadership from the top. It's about um, responsibility. Um, you know, I talk about this the, the party gate issues and, and and everything else related to this, and and then the um, the disrespect that was I think was shown actually for the for for, uh, for the system that was supposed to hold those people to, to account. It's actually a, a, it's on individuals. It's on political parties themselves. It's on it's on MPs to um, to make to make a difference, and we and that is that becomes very very difficult. Um, so. So yeah, I mean, I, I, so the laws that we can do to do this, I mean, automatic voter registration, for example, automatic would, would make a big difference in terms of uh, changing the composition of the electoral registers. It then changes how political parties go and campaign, campaign works out who they campaign for. But I think there's that just that responsibility also mm. um, on on decision makers to you know to be responsible in office. And I think, you know, that's probably something that the UK and other countries have had, had real problems with in the last few years. Yeah, I agree with that. Definitely. There are some great questions looking through the Q&A. Uh, so Tim has asked about the wealth in politics, you know, the bias of wealth in politics, and we need to break the link between parties, private wealth, you know, so you know, whether there is a way that we can sort of get public funds being decided for truly independent parties. And he suggests that people vote to allocate a few pounds per year of their tax money to one or more parties, um, you know, something like that. And I wonder if there's a way to do that. I mean, of course, um, this changed with parliamentary democracy a few decades ago because there didn't used to be any short money for the opposition. And then, no. you know, that was sort of reintroduced in the 1980s, I think. And I wonder if there's some other things like that that we can do to try to stop so, stop so much dark funding and, you know, and get a much more transparent funding model for politics. Yeah, that's a great idea. So I, I think I agree with all of those. Um, we don't have funding, public funding of political parties in the UK. Um, probably might not be super popular in many ways with, with, with the public because they think, why Why are we giving our money to political parties that they don't think are popular? But it does just help to sort of level the playing field, doesn't it? If everyone's got at least some funds from which they can kind of draw in order to stand in a the contest, then that obviously would make a big difference. Um, the other thing is that I think the ceilings for public for um, caps on spending at elections are probably too high. So we do have caps on how much candidates and parties can spend at a general election, but actually it's above what they currently spend usually. So what's the point in that overall? Um, kind of, spending limit so i think that could, that could be changed i think also looking at the um at the social media side as well making sure that this is kind of ad ad adequately covered is absolutely kind of really kind of critical so i think yeah i think it's the funding of electoral campaigns is one of the, the key ways in which the, the, the wealth um and electoral fortunes can kind of be severed a little bit it's difficult to eradicate completely unless we're really going to make but i think we can do much more um, and many other countries do just do just that so you know it's all there to be there's a blueprint to be followed 
yes last time the UK tried to do it or last time Westminster tried to do it they ended up with the lobbying act and with various other amendments to it which uh didn't actually help at all um but but uh, but effectively scared quite a lot of the campaigning organisations who were campaigning for greater democracy. So, yeah. you know, you can definitely do it badly. And the uh, the Westminster government has shown that it can do it badly. The Scottish government had a better idea there, although that hasn't mm-hmm. been spoken about very much in the last few years. So I don't know whether that's actually had any effect at all. Yeah. Looking down at the Q&A as well, there are a few other questions which are about human rights and particularly, you know, how they must be part of a democracy charter and how they must be woven in. I mean, do you think that they must be explicitly part of a constitution? Should they be something separate, which we say, you know, we have to have regard for human rights and there they are there? Should we rewrite human rights in order to get the to sort of to uh to embed them properly you know how should we deal with human rights in order to make sure that they are properly contained within whatever we're trying to do that is a great it's a great question and i welcome um uh kind of, kind of other views on this um i do think a codified constitution is obviously the 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 real end point the real goal that's you know, that's how societies make sure that these things are truly I mean, absolutely embedded and that, and that you don't have a uh, change of government that then comes in and can actually perhaps rebrand uh, human rights in some way and introduce a new human rights uh, kind of bill that actually kind of undermines those um because at the moment in, in the british constitution they're they're only there at the whim of parliament that they can be taken away at any you know, any moment in time. So it's only through, um, you know, con- a formal constitution that you could really, really um, in- in- embed those. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we have come a long way with legislation like the Equalities Act, and, and you know, over the last fifty years and so on, there has been considerable progress. Um, I guess the other kind of weak spot, in, in a way, is is thinking about how the judiciary has been. Um, of attacks in recent years as well so um you know the, the government did pass a bill to reduce the power of the, of, of the judiciary so finding ways to um, strengthen judicial power both formally and informally can be a really important way of actually making sure that those those laws if we don't get a full constitution are kind of fully respected and, and, and embedded um so i think you, you, judges are really important and that and that's once a government comes into power, that's the real change point in a way. You want them to, um, that's sometimes where governments can perhaps think, well, maybe it's more important that we focus on the economy and we, 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 we focus on public services. And therefore, it's okay to reduce uh, judicial power to get these other pieces of legislation through. But that's, that's not okay. Um, judges play a really crucial uh, kind of role. There's, there's faults with the judicial system. It's covered in the report, and there's lots of, uh, sort of racial biases in the system and everything else. But we still need judges to 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 be empowered to protect our human rights. So you've mentioned judges. We've talked a little bit about parliamentary process, or rather, we've sort of skated over parliamentary process and you know <laughs> said it's important without necessarily actually going into it. And I'm um, so sorry for those pe- for those people who wanted us to dive into it. Um, but there's a question which I think sits alongside this uh, from Vicky Vicky Seddon, which is about political parties themselves and. Can can our democratic requirements, can those insist upon parties themselves having democratic processes? You know, can you look at the parties themselves and you know have worries about the top people or arrangements, you know, people who are saying, you know, these people can stand locally, these people can't. You know, what can we say about political parties and the the democratic arrangements they have? Uh, for themselves before they get close to anything that is sort of national or local or um, you know, cross party. Uh, that's a great question, Vicky. Um, so, I mean, again, you can regulate political parties. You can have laws 
uh, that specify the democratic requirements for political parties. I mean, political parties have huge power in Britain, they, and they always really have done. I don't think that that's necessarily going to go away. Um, you know, in some countries, you look at France, the way that Macron came in, it was this talk about, oh, we can develop parties and develop in new ways, but ultimately, we can't get rid of political parties. They're always going to be there. So I think, yes, you can just make sure that they are democratic, things that make, um, you could have a bill, an act that specifies that, so um, that perhaps limits, you know, gives constitutional power to, to local associations to involved in candidate selection, for example, um, that also you know, sets out the, the structure and format of those, of those parties in terms of having you know, an executive, but how, you know, how it all kind of fits together. Perhaps having quotas in terms, um, in terms of to enable kind of inclusion uh, as, as well. So we can do all, all that, and maybe you know that's probably maybe something that could have been included in the report. So I mean, I, I don't know if you agree, Jess, or there's things I can we can miss there. This is the thing where it's always difficult to try to work out where the scope is, you know, mm. and looking at the questions we have in the Q&A, it's you know, really interesting that, you know, there are so many things that, you know, it's difficult for us to draw the boundaries and say, OK, you know, this is as far as we can go. Um, one thing actually I did want to uh, draw out from the questions and answers, um, the Q&A rather, you know, the questions has been that there have been a couple of them who have focused upon how citizens can share in the democratic process. So things like citizens assemblies, citizens conventions, you know, the first question there is about, you know, how can we, you know, how can we have more citizens conventions, you know, these are the most credible mechanism you know, to achieve some goals which are, you know, seemingly completely intractable. Um, but, you know, but there are questions further on about, you know, how we can enable uh, local people to have their say. Um, citizens conventions, of course, are um, long and complicated beasts. You know, how can we, we bring people to the democratic process without it costing vast amounts of money? Um, it, where's the balance here? Because we've clearly not got it right at the moment. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, it did seem, in, as I was writing the research on this, that there had been some progress here, some really quite important progress in the UK, particularly in, in, in Scotland, um, where they'd invested time and resources in setting these up. Um, so I would you know, encourage, encourage you to have a look, have a look at those examples. But I think it's um, I think the key thing really is linking it through to the decision making process. I mean, um, there are some things, there are some areas um, where maybe it's, we could just actually put a mandate on a public body to actually have a have a citizen assembly to consult on, on a topic, for for example, because not all decisions are actually made you know immediately are they? You know, there are some decisions that yes. That, they are time sensitive, government needs to make an action and so on. But if you think, for example, parliamentary select committee proceedings, um, you know, they, what tends to happen there is you'll have um, a call out for kind of experts. They might be um, occasionally academics, but they might be kind of uh, members of government or political parties. Um, then there's never really citizens kind of featuring on, on, on those topics, are there? So you can imagine how you could have a small group of you know, 10, 15 citizens consulting on a, on, the, on a topic, perhaps on the, you know, on the values uh, at stake. And then those um, the results or the conclusions of that group is then fed back to the, to the select committee for it to also include you know, in making it, it, its judgments. It just provides that through kind of input uh, and kind of allows deep roots from the top of the, down into society and allows, uh, allows information to go up, up, up and down. So I think there are relatively simple, um, cheap ways ways of doing that. Um, it, just, it just involves a bit more political kind of will um, to make it happen. Feels to me as though we have a lot of um, 
suggestions here you know the various groups have made a lot of different suggestions and have said you know how about having you know citizens jury you know how about having a citizens assembly you know and they're all of different levels but that at the moment they don't necessarily fit together in a clear manner you know so there aren't you know recommendations and i think that's what you mean about political will you know that nobody's got behind it and said oh okay let's take these ideas and let's put them together in a system which makes sense where the different ideas are here for people to say right we need to pick this one for this or this one for that yeah i, I think that's absolutely right and in some ways in some ways it's understandable and, and it's difficult because we do have so many governments now in the UK. So it's not just the UK, not just the UK, obviously it's Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and we do have so many forms of local government. So it's difficult to, in, in some ways to say we have one overall assembly for all of that because we have we have devolution and, and that's a good thing. Um, but at the same time, that also makes it, um, gives the opportunity, doesn't it? It means that actually, you know, um, you know, I'm in Norfolk right, right now and, mm -hmm. you know, you know, our council could do more on these issues. Neighbouring councils could do more. Scotland could do more. Uh, Wales could do more. Uh, the UK Parliament could, could could do more. So I think you know it's just such a, an open opportunity there for you know, everyone can can do more to 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 enable this. Yeah, looking at the uh, last few questions down in the Q and A, I can see a sort of a thread. So I've got the last three down there, which is. Uh, there's one which is firstly about um, basically letting community groups have more access to lobbying, you know, so, you know, so stopping lobbyists from private companies, but having more community groups, you know, being able to lobby the decision makers, which I can see the, you know, the point there. Then if I compare that with the last question, which is about the different types of democracy, you know, political democracy is perhaps, you know, not particularly effective at the moment. But supposing we focus more on the financial side, you know, worker co-ops, would that lead us, um, you know, would that lead to people becoming more competent and confident citizens? That's what that last question is asking. So I'm sort of wondering whether there's something about not just giving people power, but but really letting them know and letting them feel that they have the power. Uh, you know, how do we do that? How do we give people power to lobby, you know, for the community groups to lobby, for people to feel like they can take financial control and they can then become more, more confident citizens in various political ways as well as, say, financial ways? Yeah, the, the brilliant points, great, great questions. Um, I, I guess I try one way of thinking about it is trying to think about what, what do we mean by by lobbying, right? I mean, lobbying is sort of that mythical word um, that you see in Netflix series, and you know, people are lobbyists, and but what, what on earth does that does that actually mean? Um, and I guess it's just what it really means is having access to decision makers and to be able to provide them with information. It's not necessarily to to make them do as you do as you say but it's, it's uh, and i think therefore you can enable more people um to kind of lobby as it were just by providing greater access to to ministers greater access to mps it's just that transparency isn't it i think you, you allow them to open up their diary um to um if you like to analysis you know to you, you can imagine how i'm just thinking of <laughs> off the top of my head in some ways here but if you can imagine to share what you know what a minister's diary kind of looked like over the course of a, of a couple of months clearly there are some people he would have to or she would have to meet but um perhaps we could actually hold them to account well how many meetings did you have for example with civil society groups how many within within, within individual citizens you would expect the whole diary to be overtaken but you could perhaps um through some kind of name and shame or transparency with that information um maybe even a quota you can see how lobbying could take place through you know um through citizens and i think citizens then become more competent when they're given those access and given those opportunities yeah 
So we are coming up to seven o'clock here. Um, there have been lots of questions asked. We've managed to get through in some way or another, and I know that I've merged a lot of questions. You know, we've managed to get through 22, we think. So um, <laughs> well done. <laughs> the last question I wanted to ask, though, which is something that I think has come out of some of these, but is not a question that anybody's directly asked, uh, but it's uh, quite a simple one, which is, when the elections are coming up, you know, the next elections are coming up, we spoke about, you know, getting this into manifestos, you know, making sure that political parties realise that democracy, you know, that this is one of the big issues. But the question I have is, how do we make democracy issues glamorous? You know, how do we make them something that people really want to talk about? Because it feels as though right now, this is not something which the media want to grab onto. This is not something which, uh, um, um, yeah, this is not something which is glamorous at the moment, and I think it should be. So what do we do? Yeah, that's, that's a great question and a great point. Um, I think I would focus on the question of who decides. You know, we've got big decisions to be made, approach to Ukraine, approach to you know, public services, approach to the economy, approach to COVID. And I think during the pandemic, perhaps inevitably, perhaps necessarily, I don't know, those decisions were made by a very, very small number of people. And that was not unusual for British politics. Um, it is usually a elite driven process. It's usually power rests on a, in a very small number of people. And you know, given that we have had a small number of people make the decisions that they've made, um, who do we want to make the decisions over? Over public funding for hospitals. Uh, who do we want to make the decisions over the police? Do we want this to be a small number of people, again, in, at the top of political parties or their appointments, or do we want to open this out to everyone and give it ways in which everyone can make, uh, have more of a say, because better, uh, more people being involved leads to better decisions. These are better public services, leads to, uh, leads to a better economy. So I think that's the, probably the, the focus point that I would kind of push to is that democracy in a way is cheap. It doesn't involve a lot of money to involve more people in the decision making. Um, but the, you know, it can be a big winner um, for us and for, um, and for societies and economies and everything else kind of going, kind of going forward. Excellent. Thank you very much. That has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for the people who have asked lots of questions. We've managed to weave those in <laughs> somehow. Um, that meant that we managed to get in more than we would have, you know, by going to people directly because, you know, that always takes a little bit of time. Um, so thank you, Toby. That's been absolutely fascinating. Please do go to download the report. Um, can I hand you over to Tom to say a last word? You look like you would like to say one. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jess. And I just wanted to thank uh, both you and Toby, uh, your chairing and uh, Toby for producing the report. But someone asked in the, the chat, what are we going to do? Because it's great to produce a report, but even better to then do something with it uh, and track any impact it might have. So uh, we will be sending a copy, a hard copy of the report to all the relevant spokespeople in the different parties. So and indeed ministers, whether it's cabinet office, prime minister, party leaders and shadow spokespeople and seeking a meeting with them to discuss it so that this isn't the, the end of what we're doing. So that was the only point I wanted to make and also to thank, of course, the, the 200 or so panellists who were here from the beginning to the end. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Lovely to see you. And thank you for coming. <laughs> Yeah, no, thanks everyone. Thanks for all the brilliant questions and comments. Really appreciate them. Excellent.